This is a model of a part of the Indus River Basin in Pakistan that we built for this story. Obviously not exactly to scale. Here you can see the Indus River itself, which flows roughly from north to south, some farmland and a lot of water infrastructure, like canals, dams, and embankments. It's a system that's transformed one of the most arid regions in the world into millions of acres of farmland. And it also helped create Pakistan's precarious relationship with water. In the past 75 years, Pakistan's population has increased fivefold, while the water availability per capita is plummeting. By 2025, the region is predicted to reach absolute water scarcity. But Pakistan also suffers from increasingly severe flooding events, each one destroying land and claiming hundreds of lives. There have been more deaths in Pakistan as flooding Millions of gallons of water caused by monsoon rains. These twin water crises expose what happens when you take a river system and redesign it way past its limits. The modern water infrastructure that transformed the Indus River Basin started with British colonization in the 1800s. But we'll get back to that. Before British rule, this region was largely populated by agro-pastoralists. They'd spent centuries raising livestock and growing crops, like sorghum, vegetables, and rice along the river and they migrated depending on the Indus River Basin's fluctuations. People lived in an enchanted landscape where rivers were alive. That's Danish Mustafa, a professor in critical geography at King's College London. There were sacred waters. There is a living thing with which you interacted with all the time. This region is arid, and the Indus River and its tributaries are its singular source of surface water fed by snow and glacial melt starting in the spring from the mountains in the northeast and heavy seasonal monsoons in the summer. As it does today, this means the flow of the river fluctuates a lot throughout the year. Roughly 84% of its flow occurs from around April to October, while the other half of the year, the river flow diminishes. And if the flooding happened, the flooding would typically, water would spread out onto the floodplain? And because it could spread out all over, the flood peaks would not be that high. Pre-colonial empires built their own irrigation system, inundation canals that captured flood water and allowed irrigation several miles from the river's banks. Like the river, they flowed seasonally, filling up during peak water flow, but were dry in the winter. And crucially, they followed the landscape's natural drainage patterns. So water still found its way back to the Indus system and the sea. In the 1800s, things began to change. After a series of wars, the British took control of the Indus Basin region and it became part of their Indian empire. The new British rulers wanted to make this region as agriculturally productive as possible. They began building a much larger network of canals designed not just to capture flood season flow, but to irrigate year round and to extend the river water's reach. This water would irrigate cash crops like wheat and cotton up to 100 miles from a river source. The British built embankments to keep flood water from flowing past the river's banks. And key to this canal system's design were barrages, dam-like infrastructure that raised the river's upstream water level so that water can be funneled into canals with gates that open and close depending on water supply and demand. The completion of the Lloyd Barrage in 1932 is emblematic of this change. It's now called the Sukhar Barrage and sits on the Indus River in the province of Sindh. This project alone created canals that irrigate around 8 million acres of land. Irrigation projects turn millions of acres of once barren land into fertile soil. It's a very Western mindset. We must control nature. That's Aisha Siddiqui, an assistant professor of human geography at the University of Cambridge. It's a modernist way of, of, of looking at the river, which was involved in the early 20th century. The British Crown moved farmers onto plots of farmland along the canals and destroyed the wetlands, forests, and biodiversity that was there before. This wasn't just a project in physical engineering. It was social engineering, too. At 
at the end of the canal with the least water access. The British granted land to the agro-pastoralists. At the heads of canals, with the best water access, they awarded property to people who favored the British crown, often former military men. They then empowered these local elites to collect rents and taxes. So it became sort of a reward system to cultivate the native elites and keep them beholden to the empire. There is nothing unique about engineering rivers for irrigation. Countries everywhere do that. But the scale of this region's canals sets it apart. When the barrage is fully developed, the crop output on the land it controls will be five times as great as it is now. By 1947, at the end of British rule, the canal system had grown into a large network that turned roughly 26 million acres of land in the basin into farmland. The Indus River and its tributaries were diverted into a vast web of canals. After Pakistan won independence, the government continued this legacy, adding at least 18 new major barrages and canal links between 1960 and 1990. The system today includes over 50 canals, over 80 dams, 19 barrages, and two major drainage projects for agricultural waste. The whole canal system is considered the largest contiguous canal system anywhere in the world. This degree of manipulation has transformed Pakistan. Cities appeared in the desert. The population boomed to over 200 million. And agriculture is the country's largest economic sector, employing roughly half of the country. And it uses 90% of its surface and groundwater. This complete redesign of the country's water has some major consequences. I would say catastrophic consequences, uh, which we are seeing 150 years since its fiction. In August of 2022, an unusually heavy monsoon season flooded one third of the country, killing more than 1,600 people. The low-lying province of Sindh and neighboring Balochistan were inundated. When the water across this part of Pakistan wanted to drain back into the Indus, it couldn't find a natural path back to the river. It was blocked by the system of canals, embankments, and wastewater drains built parallel to the river. Water lingered for several weeks, causing disease and displacement. Generally, the regions most vulnerable to this type of flooding are the low-lying ones without the historic wetlands and floodplains that would have absorbed the water. The embankments along the river were built to protect regions from riverine flooding, but the government and powerful landowners are known to breach these embankments on purpose so that some land can be spared from flooding while other land gets inundated. And the wide network of barrages and canals capture and disperse the river water out in a way that diminishes the water that reaches the Indus Delta. That means seawater can intrude back into the riverbed and groundwater, destroying water sources and millions of acres of farmable land. So in the lower Indus Delta in particular, you have vast you know, land masses which are now no longer fit for agriculture and people who have been practicing particular kinds of agriculture are completely destitute. Inequality is also built into the system in terms of water access. The richer you are, better position you are in terms of access to water. That means, just like during British colonial rule, landowners at the head of canals today still benefit from this privilege of better water access, while the people at the end of the canals suffer from the most water scarcity. A similar dynamic plays out among provinces. Punjab is an upstream province, meaning they get access to the river water before Sindh in the south, and can use the control of the barrages to direct how much water flows downstream Pakistani officials have proposed building more mega dams along their rivers as a solution to water scarcity and flooding, showing they intend to continue the same colonial tradition of over-engineering the Indus River. It's a question of a very colonial mindset that has continued in post-colonial Pakistan, and that the way to manage the river basin is only through engineered solutions and not taking account for uh, indigenous knowledge systems. With a problem this massive, a single overarching solution might be impossible. 
but slow and sustained changes to water policy, like preventing more development in floodplains, clearing out obstructions to drainage pathways, and listening to local communities, could help reduce the extremely negative impacts this system has created. And thinking differently basically means to think about what have we done wrong? You need to make amends for those mistakes. A more democratic mode of going forward with water management, with flood management, with taking everyone along with you is the only recipe that I can think of.